My name is Jonathan. Though my friends call me John, I used to work as a deep sea diver doing government work. Until the accident, after that, no one wanted to hire me, a man with a criminal record. Working for the authorities, give me a break. Not even private outfits wanted me. Life was hard for a few years. Money was tight. I spent a good few months without a roof above my head. I considered taking my own life. It was in this desolate slump that my new employers contacted me. I won't bullshit you or drag this out. I work for a criminal ring operating out of Asia. I'm part of a crew they have whose only job is recovering things from the deep sea whenever they tell us to. The things we bring up can be pretty much anything. Evidence that they don't want the authorities to find. Merchandise lost in a shipwreck. Even ancient treasure, sometimes. I don't care what the job is. To be honest, I turn a blind eye to their more nefarious activities. All I care about is that they pay well. Yesterday, we were contacted with a new job. Details were sparse. A Chinese government ship had capsized in the middle of the Yellow Sea. For some reason, no rescue operation had been mounted. And the ship had sunk within an hour. There was something on board that our employers wanted. A sealed metal box, marked with several symbols in Mandarin I couldn't read. We were to reach it as quickly as possible. Recover it, and get out before the Chinese government sent their own retrieval mission. We reached the site at around 5 p.m. Just as the sun was going down, our contacts in China said we had about four hours before the authorities arrived with the equipment for a dive. Four hours. That was an amazingly quick response time, considering they'd seen fit to let the ship sink. We would have to be quick. Our man in the sea that day would be Thomas. He was a living legend in the criminal world. A veteran of hundreds of dives and dozens of daring recoveries and heists. He had more experience than the rest of us combined. And so he was the obvious choice. I helped him gear up. Gone was the high-tech equipment of my days working legally. No submersibles. One-man subs or guided robots. Back to the basics for us. Because of the depth we would be operating in. Thomas couldn't wear ordinary scuba gear. Instead, he had an improvised modern iteration of the old-style pressure suits. Those big... Bulky things you pumped with air to deal with the pressure of the seafloor. Unlike those, however, it didn't have to be connected with the surface with a long air tube. It also sported a radio link to the surface and basic life sign monitoring tools, the wonders of the 21st century. Improving on some of the oldest gear in this field. You ready for this, man? I asked, making sure the seals on his massive round helmet were secure. This is a real deep one. Thomas grinned behind the round faceplate. He beat his palms against the sides of the helmet amping himself up. Yeah, John, this'll be a cakewalk. We'll be back on land in time for lunch. I smiled. Thomas' bravado was contagious. Besides, he was right. For someone with his levels of experience, this mission was nothing. I ran down the checklist of safety checks one more time. And then, satisfied all was as it should be, patted him on the shoulder. Good luck down there, Tom. He smiled at me before turning round and stomping his way to the winch system on the side of our ship. It would lower him down to the seafloor and hoist him back up once the objective was secured. I walked quickly down a flight of stairs into the bowels of the ship and made my way to our makeshift control room. My colleagues were already there. Lai, a former Chinese deep sea scientist, and Haley, another diver turned criminal like me. The four of us, including Thomas, made up the skeleton crew of the ship. Everything set, asked Haley. She would be manning the radio today. Yeah, he's ready, I answered. Taking a seat at one of the two computers we had in the control room. On screen was a blueprint of the ship we'd be stealing from. The Yehai. I didn't ask how we'd acquired this information. It was my job to navigate Thomas through the vessel to his target. Nothing more. Across the table, Lai gave me a thumbs up. He'd be monitoring Thomas' vitals and oxygen levels today. As well as operating the winch. All set here. He said, Haley, contact Thomas. We're ready. Haley thumbed on the radio and brought the microphone to her mouth. Tom, this is Haley. Ready for insertion. Ready. Came the crackling response. Send me down. Roger that. Lie triggered the winch controls. There was a whir of metal resonating through the ship. Thomas' depth reading began dropping. It took him 15 minutes to reach the bottom. We kept in contact throughout, getting updates periodically. Everything seemed to be working fine. Finally, Thomas reached the seafloor. Status, Thomas. Haley said, can you see the target? Roger that. Thomas answered. You guys lowered me right next to her. Good job. On what side are you? I asked, scanning the blueprints. Haley passed the question along. I'm actually standing next to the deck. The Yehai landed port side up when she reached the bottom. Okay, look for the control cabin. I see a short path to the cargo room from there. I navigated Thomas through the ship. 
He really lived up to his legendary status, operating in pitch blackness with just a helmet-mounted lamp. He made quick progress through the vessel, reaching the cargo hold in only 20 minutes. Can you see the target? Haley asked. Steel box. Yellow writing on top. Negative. There's something in the water. Some sort of dust or brine or something. I can't see much. Give me a moment. We waited for about 30 seconds. Finally, the radio crackled to life again. I can see it. You won't like this, though. It's open. The impact must have broken the seals. Lai swore under his breath. Shit, is there anything around you? Anything that could have fit in the box? Maybe we can still recover it. It'd be something. At least. No, nothing here. Hang on. I'm seeing something. There's some. The radio buzzed loudly with interference. Haley frowned. Thomas' voice cut back in. Barely comprehensible with static. His voice, usually calm and collected, was suddenly tense. Oh go, WH. Is at. Without warning, the radio cut out completely. Silence fell on the control room. Thomas, Thomas, come in. Haley called out. No answer. What the fuck? I asked. What just happened? I don't know. Haley answered. The signal disappeared. Lie, vitals. Same thing. Answered lie. Leaning forward and scanning his screen. One second. I could read him loud and clear. The next. Nothing. What do we do? I asked. We've got. What? Three hours till the Chinese get here. Haley was fiddling with the radio. Trying to regain contact. I don't know. She answered me over her shoulder. If we can't get him back on the radio, we'll have to send someone down after him. They can't find him down there. It's evidence that we were here. I cursed under my breath. For some reason. I didn't want to go down into the water after Thomas. The way he had sounded before his signal had suddenly gone dead. Somehow, it scared me badly. The radio crackled to life. Haley whooped and lie grinned. Thomas, Thomas, do you read me? Haley asked. I read you. Thomas answered. I frowned. Something about his voice or his intonation seemed off, like he was doing his best to remain calm, but only just managing it. What's happening down there? I asked. Did you find the objective? No, nothing down here. I'm, I'm coming back now. Prepare to winch me up. There it was again. Unmistakable this time. Thomas' voice had changed. Somehow, he sounded strained, afraid. Even, I looked over at my friends. The grins they had been wearing a few seconds ago were gone. You hear it too? I asked quietly. Yeah, answered Lai. Is he? Is he alright? Thomas. This is Haley. My friend radioed. Is everything good down there? You sound different. Yes, I'm fine. Thomas answered. He was lying, we could tell. At the winch now. Hoist me up. Lai looked up at us. After a second's hesitation, I nodded. He triggered the winch controls, and the grinding of machinery filled the ship. We waited in silence, the air ripe with unease. Thomas was acting strangely. That much was clear. He denied it, but we could tell from his voice. Lai looked up from his computer. His vitals are elevated. He said, his heart is beating way too fast. When did it start? I asked, leaning over to have a look. Ever since we re-established contact, since then, he's been 20, 30% above the normal for a dive like this. What the hell is happening down there? Haley muttered to herself. On the radio, Thomas was silent, clicking his tongue impatiently the whole time. His depth reading went up as he neared our ship. Finally, we exited the control room and went up onto the deck. The sea parted as the bulky shape of Thomas' diving suit broke the surface, streaming water behind it. The winch raised him up over the deck, then lowered him to his feet. I started forward to help him remove the helmet, but Thomas took a step back. Thomas. What I began, confused. I. I think I'll keep the suit on for now, he said, his voice hollow but firm. He looked at me unblinkingly. I realized he was dead serious. I frowned in confusion. What? Why? I'm keeping it on. He repeated. Is everything all right? Thomas. Lie asked carefully. What happened down there? Thomas was silent for a split second. Almost imperceptibly. Nothing. He answered finally. The objective wasn't there. Must have been destroyed when the ship sank. Just an empty box. I cursed. This was bad. Our employers would not be happy about this. Lie moved forward towards Thomas. Hands outstretched to the diving suit's helmet. Come on, man. Let's get you out of that suit. No. Thomas snarled. Pushing Lai back with a shove, his face was twisted in an expression of anger mixed with desperation. A chill ran down my back. Thomas pushed past us and stomped across the deck, heading down the stairs and into the bowels of the ship. Lai, Haley and I glanced at each other. What the hell is he doing? Lai asked finally. I shrugged helplessly. I have no idea. Man, something's wrong, though. Really wrong. Let's just try and keep calm. Haley said, I'll try and do some magic on the computer. Find out what happened when the radio went dead. Lie, make us ready to get underway. I want to be far. 
Far away from here when the government arrives. John, get below deck. Find Thomas. And try to find out what the hell happened down there. My anxiety abated somewhat. She was right. Something strange was going on. But we needed to stay cool if we wanted to make sense of it all. Lai rushed off to prepare the ship for our departure. Haley patted my shoulder reassuringly and ducked into the control room, taking a deep breath. I stepped down the stairs and into the ship. It didn't take me long to locate Thomas. Our ship wasn't very big, and he had left a trail of water behind him. I found him in a storage room, sitting on top of a large container, back against the wall. Hey, man, I said, trying to fake a calmness I didn't feel. Everything all right? He looked up at me. His eyes were wild, darting around the room. Yeah, John, I'm good. So uh, what's with the suit, man? I asked, trying to sound nonchalant. I didn't know if he was thinking straight. The last thing I wanted to do was provoke some violent reaction by scaring him or sounding threatening. Thomas brought his hands up in front of him. Aye, they have to go back down once the people in charge find out we didn't retrieve anything. Might as well be prepared for it. As he talked, he moved his hands in front of himself, miming the motion of writing on a piece of paper. I looked up. His eyes were desperate, pleading. Yeah, uh, sounds good, I said absently. My mind racing, trying to figure out what he was trying to tell me. Thomas' hands kept moving writing on the non-existent piece of paper. Understanding hit me like a flash of light. I rummaged around in my pockets, looking for the items he wanted. Someone should call them, tell them what's up. Thomas continued, hands never stopping their silent movement. Finally, I produced a folded sheet of paper and the stub of a pencil. I handed them to him. He began writing, the gloves of the diving suit making him clumsy. His eyes never left me. You sure that you're all right? Thomas, I asked again, trying to fill the silence. He slid the piece of paper towards me, smiling forcefully. Never better. I looked down at the writing. Help me. It's in my suit. 